we all need to push ourselves, whether that's mentally or physically, you need to push yourself in order to evolve. And you need that slight overload in order to get better. You are listening to The Dr. Haley Show, the podcast dedicated to helping you optimize your health. Each episode, there will be an interview or a message to help you discover better health. We will be featuring health radicals on the show to bring new ideas to the table, as well as doubling down on key fundamentals to support you living your best life. Your host is no other than the founder of Haley Nutrition, Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast, and today I have Sean Spire from Aspire Labs and CrossFit. Yes. Sean, is that two different businesses? What do you got going on? Yeah, so it's Aspire Sports Lab and Aspire CrossFit. Essentially, we do group training and one-on-one training. Our group training is CrossFit. We have a CrossFit affiliate. I write all the programming for it, but it is traditional CrossFit where we do mobility, we do some strength training, and we do some high intensity interval training as well, kind of a little bit of everything within our classes. And like I said, we're a CrossFit affiliate. And I kind of branded it as Aspire Sports Lab because it kind of is my own brand, it's my own thing. We do more than just CrossFit. We do a lot of different training, especially for kind of bias towards endurance athletes from the sports side, but really just trying to help everybody mostly life-wise, just get them moving from the sedentary individuals that haven't moved for a long time to elite athletes. We'll have, you know, five to 10 people on a yearly basis do a full Ironman triathlon, marathons, half marathons. So kind of a plethora of things. And that's why kind of branded it as Fire Sports Lab, a little bit of everything in there. Now, I think those things are crazy. Have you yeah. ever done a marathon? Yeah, I've done quite a bit of marathons. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. I've done a bunch. Yeah. That's awesome. Yeah, and I like how you talked about everyone's at a different level. Totally. And for some people, it might be they can't put their shirt on anymore mm-hmm. and they have to retrain muscles or get back in shape and improve their flexibility or whatever yeah. the case is. Can't put their own pants on. Yeah. They, they have to lasso their foot and hope they hit it. And yeah. so getting back in shape, strength, flexibility, balance, coordination. Mm-hmm. One thing I like about CrossFit, it kind of incorporates all of those things naturally, correct? Correct. And especially myself, I came from a swimming background. I swam my entire life. And what turned me on to CrossFit, this was probably 2011 when I kind of got interested in it. I was done swimming. I swam in college. I was done swimming. And so much of my life was based on time. And I knew on a daily basis exactly where I was from a time point of view, whether there was 100 freestyle, 100 butterfly, 200 butterfly was my best event. But day to day, exactly where you are in training compared to your best times, as well as kind of what it should be, what I should be doing this set at or what I should be doing this particular workout at. And that was one of the things I was kind of lost in fitness when I got out of swimming and I stopped swimming competitively. I had a hard time just going to the gym and bodybuilding or doing three sets of 10 or bicep curls. And I just like to track my progress better. And that's kind of where I found CrossFit is, yes, it is a mix of everything, which I always loved being a swimmer and cross training. Mm -hmm. But I also liked the component of every workout we do or the vast majority of them has some sort of metric component because there's so much beyond health and fitness than just your weight or your body fat or your muscle mass, those are metrics that we can look at. And then obviously from a health standpoint of view, we have blood pressure and blood work and hormone levels. Those are all great, right? But there's also in terms of fitness, massive amounts that we can still track. And that's what turned me on to CrossFit, that we tracked everything every day. Maybe it was a weight I used, maybe it was a time I did a particular workout, or maybe it was the amount of repetitions that I did in a particular workout. And I enjoyed that, not only going back and repeating that workout to see if I was a little fitter than the past, Mm -hmm. but going back and just kind of knowing where I should be today to day and kind of have a gauge of how should I pace myself? How should I look at this workout and say how I can get my best potential out of it? And that's what I think the sports component of our sports lab comes to be is even when you're that sedentary individual that I first meet and I always see their shoes tied on one side because they can only reach on one side to tie their shoe because they don't have the flexibility in order to go down to their foot. Um, It just brings a component to fitness and to their, their health as well, that it's not just focused on their weight. It's not just focused on a metric or BMI, which is a terrible metric in many ways, 
but it just gives them a kind of a, whether they were an athlete in the past or not, it makes them an athlete again, which is really cool. And I think helps accountability and the sustainability of their fitness because they need to do it. They need to find something for the rest of their life. It could be just walking, but it kind of gives you a little extra something to strive towards. Yeah. How old do you think someone can be and still participate in athletics, CrossFit training? Yeah. Sports? Where's their humility at? Is their humility high? Or are they going to just walk in and try to do the same things that people a third or a half their age are doing? That is probably the hardest part about what we do is that our workouts are challenging. They're intentionally challenging and we want you to be your best self. We want you to compete with yourself, not, maybe not every day, but we want you to try hard. Sure. And that's when the humility component comes into because we can have someone that's never done anything and walk through our doors. And as long as they're humble and they're able to go do the workout at their own pace or to their own abilities, there's no age limit. We have two, two members actually that just hiked hundreds of miles this past summer in Italy. And they actually had friends leave their trip because they couldn't keep up with them hiking. And they're in their mid seventies. <laughs> and, um, but they're humble. They come in and do what they can do or do what they should do according to their bodies and their own limitations. So the answer is there's no real age limit. And there's an old adage in CrossFit that, and I believe within our business and, and my fitness is that it's for everyone, but not anyone. And no, for anyone, but not for everyone. anyone, but yeah. not everyone. Cause yeah. yeah, it's, it is for anybody. Anybody can walk in our doors and, and do it, but you need to be humble. You can't do necessarily what these other people are doing. You can't do what maybe you did when you were in the Marines 30 years ago. You know, you have to know your body now and know that little gains, little progressions are massive within their own fitness journey. You know, it seems like the perfect time for me to ask you this. Mm -hmm. Jake Paul or Mike Tyson? Um, funny enough, I don't follow sports <laughs> that well. I do sports. I am athletic. And when it comes to those individuals, I don't really follow Jake's journey. Obviously, I know who they are and, and Mike Tyson, but I don't know. I don't have a good answer for you because I don't follow <laughs> it enough to actually give you a good answer. It, it, Sorry. I'm, I'm, there's a, there's a few categories on Jeopardy that you would think I should be really good at. <laughs> Pop culture is nothing. I don't know anything about what's currently going on in a lot of ways. And in sports, weirdly enough, I don't follow as much as you would think I would. Well, I think it's going to be an entertaining event. But Mike Tyson is, okay. I don't know, 58, 59 years old or something like that. Mm -hmm. I can relate to that. He's essentially my age. Mm -hmm. Mike mm -hmm. Tyson's a lot older, mm -hmm. but still, man, what an experienced boxer. Yeah. Uh, but now you're looking at also the, it's age versus experience as yeah. well in a lot of ways. And that's, that's with life. Sometimes inexperience is a good thing, right? We don't overthink things. We are very humble to new ideas and we'll try anything. But at the same time, that experience, if you're very experienced at something, sometimes that's the advantage of knowing what your lane is, what you should be doing and not going outside of that and being more successful because of it. Right. Right. So well, I think it's what's better experience or, or ability. I don't know. In this case, yeah. here's my take on it. Yeah. From a boxing perspective, experience, Mike Tyson, he he has a solid guard mm -hmm. and his punches come from his guard. Yeah. They move from the bottom. He uses his whole body into mm -hmm. it. Jake Paul has this almost like this, like he's got his hand back here. Yeah. Horrible technique. And I think for that reason, he doesn't stand a chance. I know he's been working on his technique. Yeah, because if you, I mean, when you look at boxing, especially like a heavyweight like Mike Tyson, one hit is all yeah. it takes. Yeah. And I don't think, one I think hit the way he takes. covers, I don't think Jake's going to get in there. Yeah. It doesn't hurt that much getting your hands hit. No. No. <laughs> or your gloves hit. Yeah. What would your ideal gym have in it? And how close are you to having that? Mm. What would my ideal gym have? I would say I almost have my ideal gym. And the only fitness equipment that I think might be nice for some members, and I, I wouldn't argue it for me, would be we don't have any treadmills or anything like that. I'd get some couple air runners so they don't complain too much when it's raining or too hot outside. To, when I ask them to go run, uh, we can just run right there instead. But right, personally, I like running in the middle of the day. I love that 12, 1 o'clock on a summer day is my ideal time to go for a run. So fitness wise, I guess I could put a couple air runners in there. But I think in reality, um, more recovery protocols. We're a gym. We have all the equipment we need, I think, 
coaching is more important than equipment. I could coach a fantastic group of people to the best workout to their abilities with no equipment whatsoever. Mm. So coaching, I think, is more important. However, equipment's nice to, to add in there and adds a little bit of diversity and fun, keeps you interested. But it would be recovery protocols. We don't have anything from a recovery standpoint. I would love infrared saunas. I would love cold plunges. Ice plunges. I, I would love to be able to do those contrasts back and forth. And that's what I would add. Wouldn't be fitness equipment and be recovery protocols to make sure that they're uh, performing at their best. Yeah. Okay. So I go hot and cold. That's what I've done. Yeah. Have you done the ice plunge? Oh yeah, definitely. Yeah. yeah. We have an ice maker and I put it into a tub, um, but it's kind of a complicated process. Not really a members thing, more just a me or whoever wants to go get their own ice. I was tempted to do it because we have this huge freezer right on the other side of this wall mm -hmm. and we could, we've got the five gallon pails that we can fill up with water and, mm -hmm. and dump them in the ice yeah. tank Yeah, and it'd be a nice affordable. All we need is a tank big enough to stick a person in. Totally. And I know I have a friend that's made one out of a freezer and she oh, yeah. just sealed it up. Oh and, yeah. So there's all kinds of options for that, mm -hmm. but I haven't done it. Now, Michelle that you met downstairs, mm -hmm. She goes from the tent sauna yep. to the swimming pool. Okay. Which in the winter time, maybe 60s. It's no ice plunge. Yeah, but still the contrast is there, mm -hmm. which is important. That's the most important thing is the contrast between the two, the hot and the cold, um, according to believers slash research slash anecdotal evidence. Yeah. Well, okay. I, I haven't yeah. tried it yet. Try uh, it out. Closest I got to it was the uh, ALS bucket challenge okay. <laughs> years ago. Yeah, yeah. But so the ideal gym, really, mm -hmm. you need people and you can use your own body weight, but having those other things is nice. Yeah. You mentioned coach being important. Mm -hmm. What are some of the things that you've seen go wrong where people didn't have a coach? Yeah. And that's something that for most of my life, I kind of estimated it 96, 97% of my training. And I've trained almost every day since I was seven years old. 34 now, that is a lot of training days. I've never taken more than a week off. It, it just hasn't happened. So that's actually something that I have to empathize with that people that have done the opposite, haven't done anything for 30 years. I've done something every day for 30 years or, or 20 something years. And almost all of that, 98% of the time has been with a coach or been with a group. Mm. Very little of it is by myself. The only time I'm really by myself is Maybe if I'm training for an Ironman or something, I'm swimming, biking, or running, I'm doing some things by myself. But it's written down. I'm following a program that I wrote. So I'm my own coach, basically. But I'm still following something prescribed. So I think it's incredibly important for a lot of people. Um, obviously, some people can do things themselves. They're self-motivated. They don't need a group. They don't need a coach. Awesome. Especially for low-intensity exercise like walking, things like that. But without a coach... Well, first of all, from the accountability standpoint, it's really hard to stay motivated without someone actually there, physically there, making you do it. And some people can find that via an online coach, which I do some of as well. Some of people can follow it through online channels like a Peloton app or other apps, things like that, which is great. But from my experience, the highest accountability and the highest probability that you're actually going to do this exercise is with somebody is standing in front of somebody. So in terms of a coach, that's number one, actually doing it. And then secondly is having a coach prescribed workout, not only is ensuring that you're doing the right things for you and your body and your goals, but you're doing it properly as well. It's really easy to have improper technique and having that coach there, that second eye there is just vital to make sure you're doing it right. Especially when you get to the point where you're really pushing yourself. If you're doing something, you know, a sub-maximal load that's not really going to hurt yourself, like, is that that important? Maybe, maybe not. But as you're really pushing yourself, especially through high intensity, having that eye watching you, making sure that form stays on, on point is vital. And then also just making sure you're doing the right stuff for your body. I write all of our workouts at our gym six days a week, but I physically prescribe people depending on their goals. Maybe you only do these workouts this week. Because there's may maybe maybe it's a woman who we're ensuring that cortisol levels don't get too high and we don't want to do too much high intensity exercise. So I'm making sure that she only comes twice a week or so, or maybe three times a week and making sure I pick the right workouts for her. So even though I wrote six workouts a week, I'm still prescribing which ones are going to be best for her because everybody is different. 
Right. So I think it's one, the accountability, two, the form and technique, but three, just making sure that they're doing the right things for their particular body. Because what you see on Instagram that that fitness influencer is doing is maybe not the right thing you're doing, especially if they're half your age and mm. have a much different lifestyle than you. Are you enjoying the show thus far? One of the many health secrets that we have covered on the show is all around aloe vera, specifically drinking raw aloe vera. Our aloe vera has helped our customers effectively heal their gut, increase their intestine health, lower inflammation in the body, eliminate and or decrease acid reflux, have glowing skin and hair, and so much more. Now, as a frequent member of our audience, you will be exposed to exclusive specials and coupon codes for the awesome products manufactured by Haley Nutrition. That's right, for simply being awesome and tuning in, you can get a mini discount to help you optimize and better your health. To see how we can help and support you on your health journey, tune into the episodes and listen for coupon codes that you can use at www.haleynutrition.com before you make your orders of raw aloe vera. Once again, it's www.haleynutrition.com. Now, back to the show. Is there competition in uh, CrossFit? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's one of the things that mm -hmm. inspires a lot of people, motivates me. You know, we always want to push ourselves because we're having so much fun because we're competing. Yeah. Win or lose doesn't matter, but yeah. it's just the fun of competition. How does that work in CrossFit? Totally. And I love that. So at our gym, we have an app that we utilize that has basically a daily leaderboard. So people will log their scores and log their whatever time domain. And this is about half the people do this. Half the people don't, they just want to get a good workout. But another half will actually get onto that leaderboard and kind of see the different people that they're trying to compete against. There are fitness competitions around South Florida as well as national that you can actually physically go and do these functional fitness competitions. And then also what just ended was called the CrossFit Open. That's a three week um, workout series where CrossFit, who we are an affiliate, so we pay an affiliate fee. CrossFit has like an HQ headquarters that kind of um, monitors all of it to, to a degree. It's, it's very independent. We get to run our business any way we want to. However, they do some things as well. And they do something called the CrossFit Open. That is three weeks. They release one workout and then you have basically from Thursday to Monday to complete the workout. Okay. And everybody all around the world does it. You submit your score. There's another leaderboard that you can kind of gauge where you're at. And then people go on from there to go to the CrossFit Games, which is the worldwide CrossFit championship, essentially, the CrossFit Games. And they also have uh, age groups as well, which is really cool. So I would hope so. Starting at 35 and on, they have five-year increments for age groups. Oh, so okay. you, you can be in the 40 to 45 or whatever age group that you're particularly in. 55 to 60. Yeah, there you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. Well, that sounds fun. Mm -hmm. Man, I like it. I feel like I'm missing out. Yeah, you should I've give it a try. I've been to the gym, I've, I've lifted weights, I stretch, and I've done, but I've never done CrossFit. Yeah. I'm a little You got to join us for a class and see what yeah, you think. Yeah. You're actually right across the from the my neighborhood as well. Okay. I live literally behind where we used to be. Yep. In that neighborhood back there, awesome. so I will have to cool. will have to check it out. Yeah. What do you think about the statement no pain no gain? I think no pain, no gain has a time and place. We all need to push ourselves, whether that's mentally or physically, you need to push yourself in order to evolve and you need that slight overload in order to get better. I think the term no pain, no gain gets overemphasized and overused. When I look at um, either a week or a month or just our overall life, when it comes to training, I think the vast majority of our training we're talking 60 to 70% of that should be at a low intensity. We should essentially, if you look at it like a professional athlete, be practicing, okay? Practicing is low intensity, perfect form, perfect technique. That's 60 to percent of your time you're doing, you're moving perfectly or you're doing mobility or stretching or yoga or just low intensity walking. 60, 70% of the time, pretty easy stuff. Just do it well. Now, that next one is training. So about 20 to 30% of the time we're training. Intensity is higher, but our form is still perfect. Our technique is still perfect. And maybe we're pushing towards that threshold, but not necessarily getting to that point. And then lastly, about 10% of the time, we should be competing. That is when that adage of no pain, no gain might come into place because we do need to push. We do need those muscles to hurt. 
We need to push our body past what it can do, past that threshold in order to be better. Now, I'm talking more from a muscular standpoint in order to make muscular change or even mental change to push ourselves a little bit beyond what we think we could go. But there's always that thought of injury as well that we want to make sure we avoid. If it's pushing our body to do something that is making us better, we should push through that pain. If it's pushing ourselves through a pain that is now injuring us more, right. you need to be humble, going back to that H word, and stop. Yeah. And there's one exception to that, and that is in an actual competition. I have people that have trained for a year or maybe even longer have wanted to do something like an Ironman triathlon or an ultra marathon, mm -hmm. 50 plus miles, or even a marathon or even a right. half marathon if that's been their goal for a long time. If they're on race day and something hurts, it might be more important for them to push through that pain and deal with it after. Right. Because for them, so much of their life has been dedicated to this goal yeah. and they need to get there. They want that victory yeah. and it's part of, yeah. We'll deal with it later. This body is going to wear out eventually. Well, it's meant to be used up. Yeah. And the reality is, I mean, in training, I want you to stop before injury. I right. don't want you to keep getting injured because what do I want you to do tomorrow? I want you to train again. And I want you to be able to move through life and pick up your kids and stand up from the desk and not be in pain day to day. But on that particular day, if you've been training for a long time for one thing, you might just need to hear some tape. Let's wrap it up and keep going. Iron Man's hurt. Ultra marathons hurt. You're going to get hurt. The first oh, ultra man. marathon was the Western States 100 and it's a hundred mile run in California. And it was a horse race. And I forget all the details of it, but something happened with one of the horses and the person had to run it oh, my. and, uh, just kind of, just kind of came into play that way. Now it's the Western States 100. So yeah. Wow. Yeah. But those things should hurt. So that is pain. Right. And we'll worry about it tomorrow. On the topic, and as a swimmer, yeah. I think you're too young to know Jack Nelson. I know Jack Nelson, yes. Okay. Yeah. He used to talk about pushing yourself, but when you swam in competition, he'd have you swim below 100%. Because okay. at some point in time, you're fighting against yourself. Mm -hmm. And so it was neat. It's like, no, maybe maybe swim at 97%. Yeah, yeah. And, and that might be your fastest time. Yeah, so. yeah. And especially with swimming or any endurance race, like pacing is so vital that taking it too hot out of that gate or off the block in that case is detrimental sometimes, even in a race that's a minute long. If you burn out too quickly, that heart rate jacks up too high to that threshold rate. Like it's hard to come back from that. So easing into it a little bit more is definitely the, uh, the right call. Yeah. Yeah. As a swimmer, I never swam butterfly okay. because it was horrible. Mm -hmm. It was just a very difficult. And then when I retired from swimming, so to speak, going down to the city pool and just doing laps a few days a week, butterfly was my go-to. Mm -hmm. I fell in love with it, loved the stroke butterfly. Mm -hmm. It just felt so natural. It was hard at first to get strong enough to be able to do it. And yeah. then it just, you just kind of flow through the water. I think it was the stroke that was meant to be. I mean, I, I thought- and Why was that? Was it the challenge that kind of got you into it or why did you revert back to the one stroke that you did not like as you had while you were swimming? Yes. I wanted to, I like to do things that I can't do. Mm -hmm. I like to figure out how to do things that I can't do mm -hmm. and find out that, no, you can actually do them. Mm -hmm. But as I got those muscles stronger mm -hmm. and stronger, it just became natural and it actually felt good. Mm -hmm. The uncomfortable became the comfortable. Mm -hmm. It was a very neat thing. But yeah. I, thought it was cool that that was your stroke yeah from the start in competition yeah. and in yeah, mine college, wasn't by choice though it just happened to be the one i was best at coach said this is you yeah you're entering yeah you're gonna do the 100 you're gonna do the 200 yeah, yeah. it wasn't the most fun all the time because it is a challenging stroke as you know but it was what i was best at so i went with it all right in business, I like to look at and say okay what makes someone successful what are the traits of a successful entrepreneur if you look at some of the best people in your industry in CrossFit in mm -hmm. their training, what are some of the traits that make them successful and some of the best in competition and in fitness and their abilities? Yeah. We can look at genetic factors. We can look at someone's height or their background in terms of are they a weightlifter or are they a runner? going into the sport of CrossFit. But I think it all comes down to what most things come down to, which is your mind. 
most things I do think come down to your mind. Cause even if you have the best genetics in the world for whatever particular sport or activity you're doing, if you don't have that mental strength to go with it, you know, what's the point? And I think it's that mental fortitude. It's the mental fortitude of being able to push, but also the humility to say, I shouldn't push too hard today. It's that mental ability to analyze what you're doing and wondering, is that the best approach or should I be trying something new? It's that experimenting with that new and analyzing whether that was better than the previous thing you did and then retesting it and going back, back and forth to find out what is truly the best way to do X, Y, or Z, whether it's to get stronger, what's the best way to get stronger? What's the best way to increase my endurance? Is it to do more anaerobic lactate threshold training, or is it more of a heart rate approach that I want to do more longer duration zone two training? Um, is heart rate even the measure I should be looking at, or should I be looking at RPE rate of perceived exertion and seeing how do I feel today and trying to stick to those guidelines. Well, I, I just want a steady state today and a, a talkable pace the whole time, conversational pace. So I think it all goes back down to your mind. Yeah. What is your mind willing to do? And where's your mind willing to allow yourself to go? And what things is your mind allowing you to try in order to be the best at your sport or your business or your family yeah. or whatever those things are? It all comes back to that. Yeah. And now if you have the mind plus the genetics, then you become Michael Phelps, <laughs> you know, he was something. He was amazing. I think, I think when you look at those top tier athletes, when you look at Michael Phelps in swimming or someone like in the CrossFit world on the female side, it'd be someone like Tia Claire Toomey or on the male side, like Matt Frazier or Rich Froning. I think those are when those two things come together and you have champions in every sport that are dynasties are people that have won time and time again. Maybe it's yeah. three in a row or three out of five or five years in a row or whatever your particular sport is. I think when you look at those individuals, they have the genetics plus the mind. Right. And right. when those come together, you become someone truly special in your generation. Yeah. And then when you have those other people, you might have people that have the mental strength, but not all the genetics. You can still win. You can be a gold medalist or a CrossFit Games champion or a Super Bowl MVP, but it might only be once. And that's okay. Or conversely, have all those genetics, that genetic potential is completely there, but your mind's not truly there. You can still win. You can still probably win a couple times, but it's not going to be that kind of ongoing generational strength and, and winning that you would have if you put both together. Yeah, yeah. I'm Dr. Haley and oddly the supplement that changed my health the most was not aloe vera. It was powdered fruits and vegetables, but it did not come in capsules. I used to take a brand that came in capsules and I did not notice a difference. But when I tried a brand where the serving size was a scoop equal to more than 40 capsules, I could feel a difference. That's where Aya Green's powdered vegetables and fruits comes in. And to make it easier for you this month, April of 2024, you can use the coupon code IAGREE, one word, I-A-G-R-E-E, -E, without any spaces, to get 20% off a single can purchase. Normally, you'd have to buy a bundle of three to save 20%, but I'm convinced you will notice a difference, you will notice the benefit, and come back for more. There's a good chance you'll also find a free shipping option. So head to HaleyNutrition.com now and use the promo code IAGREE for 20% off IAGREEN's single can throughout April 2024. Now, back to the show. From what I've seen, uh, the people that set goals mm -hmm. and strive for them, uh, they tend more likely to accomplish. And the people that have a why, why are you doing this? Why are you getting up every day to go to work and run your business? Why are you getting up every day to go to the gym and get fit? Is it, is it for you, for your personal goals? Is it for your family? And it doesn't seem to matter what the reason is, as long as it's important to you, that why mm -hmm. factor. And that's one of the most important things with people in our gym and coming into the gym or just want to do X, Y, or Z when it comes to health and fitness is finding out that why. And it's not, they think it's a superficial, many of them think it's a superficial why of, I want to look good in a bathing suit, or my doctor told me to lose 20 pounds, or, you know, I really just know I need to get healthier. That's like a superficial why they, they think it's the reason, but it's really not. It's much deeper than that. And to dig through those layers and 
uh, weirdly enough, if I was to go back to school, I don't think exercise, you know, what things could I study to make me most successful in what I currently do? It's not necessarily exercise science, which is what I did study. It's more psychology. On the business end, it's more business. But psychology is incredibly important because we need to peel back those layers of that why. Because that why of your doctor telling you to lose 20 pounds is not getting your ass out of bed at 5 a.m. It's not. It's not getting you to the gym after a crazy long day at work. Or in my current case with a toddler and a newborn, it's not making dinner, making them eat, putting them to bed, being tired. It's 8 o'clock at night. I got up at 430 and then I go out and do a run. That needing to lose 20 pounds is not the why that's going to get me to do that. That's going to get me to sit on my ass back on the couch. Right. And that's okay. But my why is much deeper than that. And if we can peel back those layers on people's why, you're going to really unlock somebody's potential. Yeah. Yeah, when your why is for that toddler and the newborn, that's a heck of a lot more important than what ring on your belt you're at. Yeah. I mean, that's a... That's a marker, right? And that can be part of it. When I have a, a guy or a girl come to me and say, I want to look, I want to take my shirt off at the beach or I want to put this bikini <laughs> on. Like, that's great. I think that's a fantastic marker that we should strive towards. <laughs> but that's just not going to be the one that gets your ass out of bed or makes you make the right choice when it comes to your nutrition. Or if you're out with friends saying no to having a drink when you really want to have one, it's just not enough. It's great. And it should be part of someone's vision board, if you will, but it's not going to be the one that makes the right decisions day in and day out. Um, yeah. What do you say so to someone that's thinking about coming to your gym? Is there a best time? Someone that hasn't been to a CrossFit gym, doesn't know much about it. They maybe have an interest. You have a opportunity for them to come and learn. How does that work? Yeah. The best thing they can do is come meet with myself or one of our coaches first. Because the reality is it can be kind of a tough world to navigate walking into this gym and it is not a gym full of exercise machines and okay, I'll get on the elliptical. It's an open space with weights and medicine balls and kettlebells and oh man, how do I use all these things? Meeting one-on-one -on -one is our best pathway for somebody so I can learn a little bit more about them, find out what their current obstacles are, find out how they currently eat, what they currently do for movement, and then dive into that most important thing there, why? And then sit with them and whether they do it with us or do it with somebody else or I'm giving them just advice in general because we're not the right person for them at their life right now. I'm giving them a blueprint to, to get to those goals. And they're going to leave with that and at least have a really good plan on how to get to where they need to be. It might be with us. I hope it is. But it might be just, hey, I need you to drink more water and go on three 30-minute walks per week. After you do that for about a month, let's retalk. Let's talk again and bring you back in here. Yeah. Something else I noticed about CrossFit gyms, they have something you don't see in any other gym and that's community. Mm -hmm. Yeah. How yeah. many people know each other that go to your gym? In my head, I like to think everybody knows each other, but that's because I know everybody and they don't because it's funny if somebody attends a different class, all of a sudden I realize, oh my gosh, they don't know everybody in this class. They know everybody in and around their class times. And I'd say 70, 80% of people come to the same class every day. So they know a big portion of the gym, but unless they come on Saturdays, which is when people from all different times all come together, they might not know everybody, but you're going to know everybody in your class and they're going to hold you accountable, which is really cool. And I think going back to that, why are coaches important? Community is equally important. And that's one thing that post COVID, I think people have realized is other people are incredibly important in their life. And when it comes to doing something you might not want to do, like attend a workout, you have that community there that's going to help hold you accountable as well. So they get to know each other. They go out and do happy hours by themselves. They come in when we have events and everybody gets to meet each other from different classes, which is really cool. But they find, I mean, we've had two people get married that have met at the gym. Um, we've had people break up too, but that's, <laughs> that's part of it. Right. Life. But lifelong friends, people that go on trips together, people yeah. that have bought houses together now, and they've become that kind of core community. Cause what we're, what the, there's a saying, you are the average of the four or five people you surround yourself around. 
that's what I tell people too when they come to me with that why and they have that lifestyle, that sedentary lifestyle and need to make a major change in their life. They need to surround themselves with like-minded people and the people that are going to be negatively influencing them. I'm not saying they need to kick them out of their life, but maybe they do, especially if they're not family. And we need positive people around us and like-minded people if we want to be better. That is one thing Aspire brings to our members is you are there being around like-minded people that want to be better, that want to learn new things and want to just live the best life that they can live. What about uh, some final words of encouragement to anyone that's thinking about doing this? Yeah, I think there's two primary things that I tell people when it comes to health and fitness is and the first thing is don't put it on a pedestal. Fitness isn't this crazy thing that is unattainable or you need to think that you need to be very complex with it or what program should I follow? Which, start moving. You like walking? Great. You like swimming? Do that. You like doing yoga? Awesome. You need to move daily. I want everybody to move as much as possible. Whatever that is, we can work out the details later. Same with food. Don't overcomplicate it. Don't wonder, what diet should I do? What pill should I take this at? Just start eating real foods. Start there. If it roamed on the ground or grew on the ground, it's probably okay. And then you can kind of figure out what's best for you there. But if it's just a real whole food, it's probably good for your body. Then we can worry about, should I do this? Or should I do that? Should I include or exclude? Should I go organic? Should I not go organic? Just eat real food to start. Get rid of the sugar, get rid of the preservatives, and eat real food. Yeah. Move, eat real food. And once you start thinking that it's this incredibly complex thing that you can't do or it takes a lot of time, it doesn't. 10 push-ups a day is 3,650 push-ups a year. Really adds up. Do something. Do 10 squats. That's more than you did yesterday. Well, I don't know what you did yesterday. But start with doing something. And then that comes down to something I really teach and preach is called I call it elementary fitness or elementary health and fitness. And that's just looking at you know, your typical grading scale that we would in school and looking at that in your days and your week. A seven out of seven is 100%. I don't want anybody to be perfect. Perfect means moving today and eating whole foods, yeah. okay? I don't need anybody to be perfect. We don't need to be 100. That is something that's unsustainable and probably not gonna be what they do for the rest of their life. A six out of seven is an 85%. That's, that's a B, that's doing pretty good. So if you are six out of seven days a week moving and eating whole foods, it's an 85%, you are going to progress towards a healthy lifestyle and make the goals that you want. One day, you can kind of do what you want, which is when order pizza, go out and have a beer with your friends. That's great, do that once a week. Now we keep going down the line. Five out of seven is a 71%. That is maintenance mode. Once you hit your peak shape, where you want to be physically, where you want to be mentally, you actually kind of get two days a week to do what you want. That's Saturday, Sunday. But this is the problem that so many people come to me. So many people know kind of what they should be doing. They know generally what's good food. They know generally they should, they should move more. The problem is they do it Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, maybe not so much. They come home, they maybe go out to eat Saturday, completely off track Sunday, maybe off track as well. Now all of a sudden they're at a four out of seven. That's a 57% yeah. and they're failing. Monday you're starting over. <laughs> four out of seven days a week is not enough. It's a 57% and you're regressing. So as I preach to people, like I said, keep it simple, move more and eat real foods. But six out of seven days a week, you're gonna be progressing. It's an 85%, five out of seven, 71% you'll maintain, but you're not gonna progress. You're not gonna regress either though. But four out of seven is where so many people live. They know what to do. They just don't do it consistently enough to 57%. Keep it simple and be a little bit more consistent. And the vast majority of people are probably going in the right direction. Yeah, yeah. I could do that on my diet. I could do my diet seven days a week. <laughs> That's easy for me. Yeah. Because I like good food. Yeah. I like real food. Yeah. I don't like packaged things. Yeah. I don't like chemicals. The exercise thing. Okay. I, I, I'm going to have to step up my game. Simplify it. What do you enjoy doing? And do a little bit of it. But one of the key books I read years ago was James Clear's Atomic Habits. And he has a two minute rule in there. And I always wanted to be a reader. 
I wasn't a great reader. I was kind of always told I was a slow reader. I didn't like reading. And so I kind of built up in my head this false um, perception that I was not a reader. And in Atomic Habits, which I listened to because I wasn't a reader yet, was the two minute rule. You can do anything for two minutes. Yeah. And I wanted to start reading. So I started reading for two minutes every night. And you know what I did? I became a reader. Mm. Some nights I still only read for two minutes and that's okay. Other nights it goes for longer, yeah. but especially with exercise, it's do something for two minutes. Yeah. Two yeah. minutes of push-ups is really hard, by the way. You I, can't do two minutes straight of push-ups. Oh yeah? No way. I, I believe you. Straight, non I've, I've never tried it. I, I don't know. It's really hard. Without putting your knees down, I mean, I it would be I could do it because I do push-ups every single day, but it, I that could be my workout for today. I'd yeah. be good. It's really hard. So do something for two minutes. That's like a exercise snack. Yeah. Yeah. That'd be great. There's oftentimes, instead of reaching for that second cup of coffee or whatever it is later in the day, I'll just do like one big set of push-ups, mm -hmm. and it really just uh, well, I could do that. Wakes you up. I can do that. And that's it. It's compound you know, interest. I know you can do super slow squats. You don't even need weight. You're just using your body weight. Mm -hmm. 15 seconds up and down cycle. Yeah. Like that. Tempo's Four perfect for that. Yeah. In in a minute. Yeah. <laughs> Tempo's perfect for that. Especially with body weight, adding tempo is incredibly difficult and a great way to add some intensity. Yeah. I yeah. like it. Sean, thank you for joining me and teaching me so much too. Yeah. Thank you, man. This is awesome. I'm, I feel like I benefited and, and I'm inspired. Awesome. Well, thanks for having me. You got to come to the gym sometime. Will do. Yeah. Awesome. Thank you so much. Oh, one more thing. Hit me. How do people find out about you? What's the website? Yeah. Check out AspireSportsLab.com and you can find us on Instagram at AspireSportsLab. You can find us on me on Instagram as well at Sean Spire. And if you need anything, email me directly, Sean at AspireSportsLab.com. We'll go right to my inbox. Great. Thank you. Yeah. Thanks so much. I hope you enjoyed that episode today on the Dr. Haley Show. Make sure to hit subscribe on whichever platform you are listening to this. If this episode made you think of someone, go ahead, take a screenshot, and share this exact episode with them. You can catch the show notes for this episode on www.drhaley.com. If you want to geek out with Dr. Michael Haley on other radical health topics, be sure to check out his YouTube channel, where he posts exclusive video content. All the details are at www.drhaley.com, and we can't wait to hang out with you on the next episode.